What you are about to watch is likely different from most videos you've seen before. Admittedly, it is intense and contains a lot of information. There is no agenda behind this film and no money to exchange hands. You will likely find yourself pausing this video, taking notes, and looking things up to fact-check and learn more. This video attempts to coherently deliver a single package of truth, one big picture that makes sense out of our mysterious existence and brings peace and understanding. The United States was founded on the principle that all individuals are created equal, that every person has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness without the fear of persecution or torture. America has become known as the land of the free and the home of the brave. And then, September 11, 2001 confronted America with great changes. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. America had to rethink the issue of freedom in a dangerous world. Changes entered our lives, and freedom could no longer be taken for granted. Some have proposed that secret societies or other entities are responsible for the restrictions we now face. But is there a more sinister power at work whose ultimate plan is far worse? History demonstrates that restricting freedom has dreadful effects. Examples of the restriction of freedom of religion, press, and speech can be seen in some nations around the world. Arguably, the worst result of restricting freedom is genocide as depicted by Stalin's Russia and Hitler's Germany. The tendency of such dictators has been to persecute and, if need be, to attempt to eliminate dissenters, particularly those in the religious minority. The longest period of religious intolerance and persecution was that found during the Middle Ages. Some 60 million persons perished by the state church in the name of God. Those who disagreed with its creed were brutally tortured and murdered for crimes such as owning or copying short passages of scripture or reading them aloud. The Founding Fathers knew of these abuses and for that reason took great pains to preserve the freedoms of speech, press, and religion. Today we are still the home of the brave, but are we truly the land of the free? Is it possible that even America could, in the name of safety, make similar mistakes? 
the Bible which predicted the rise of America and its wonderful future, which also predicted the end of Middle Ages persecution at about the same time, also predicts the answer to this question and sounds a clear warning of a conspiracy that has been working for thousands of years. Its goal is to eliminate freedom and enslave humanity. It all began in a place called heaven. The Creator, God, and His subjects lived in a society of perfect liberty and happiness. Among God's subjects were angels who joyfully served Him. The highest ranking angel was Lucifer, the chief musician. His position allowed him to know God's character better than any other created being. Lucifer was perfect, but over time, proud of his intelligence, his talents, and his beauty, he began to think that he should be equal with God's Son. Desiring God's throne, Lucifer broke God's law by choosing himself over God and for the first time, sin existed. To leave no question as to the nature of Lucifer's sinful desires, God gathered the angels together and in clear terms told them that his son was God, had been with him from eternity, and deserved the same love and respect due God the Father. Lucifer, jealous and enraged at the favor shown to the Son, now waged the first conspiracy to dethrone him, stating that God's government was unjust and that the freedom and liberty of angels was in jeopardy because the Son was placed over them instead of himself. On the other hand, God contended that his law was the source of liberty and happiness and that keeping it allows for liberty from sin, without which the result would be death. The peace and happiness that had always been known was now gone. Amidst the confusion and bewilderment, Lucifer offered the angels a new government of supposed liberty devoid of God's law and convinced one-third of heaven's angels that his rebellion was justified. He hoped to gain the allegiance of all heaven and be equal with God himself. God's loyal angels pled with Lucifer's angels and nearly convinced them they were wrong and needed to ask for forgiveness. Lying, Lucifer argued that God's law did not allow for forgiveness and that their only hope was to gain by force their liberty from God. And at this point, Lucifer had gone too far. Knowing the love and mercy of God better than any other created being, he rejected his Creator. Worse yet, he misrepresented him to the universe. As a result, his name was changed. Henceforth, he would no longer be known as Lucifer, the light bearer, but Satan, the adversary. The Bible also refers to him as the dragon. Gathering the entire heavenly host, God announced that in order to regain the happiness of heaven, Satan and his followers must be cast out. Witnessing before all present, each angel chose his leader and engaged in war. The Son and his angels fought against Satan and his angels, and the Bible says that God's Son prevailed. Of course, God would have been right to immediately destroy Satan and his angels, but in his mercy he allowed Satan to live on, despite knowing the atrocities that would result because the only way to prove to the universe that Satan's accusations were wrong was to allow him to fully demonstrate the horrible result of a government devoid of God's law. After being expelled from heaven, Satan adopted a new, lying, argumentative strategy. 
Once he realized he could no longer be reinstated to heaven, he now stated that not only did God's law restrict liberty, but that it was impossible to keep it. Before Lucifer's fall, God had planned to create a new world with beings that were made in his image. And now, despite Satan's rebellion, God continued his plan to create beings with freedom of choice. And the Bible puts it this way, In the beginning the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. Using the creative power of the Godhead, the sun spoke the heavens and earth into existence in six literal days. On the sixth day, he created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, and placed them in their new garden home, a place called Eden. The son himself performed their wedding and then, as a symbol of his love, gave them something very special, a wedding present, a day called the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, a day of rest, a day to spend with him and to remember as long as time would last. They weren't here by accident, they had a loving Creator. In a sense then, the Sabbath was a gift to all mankind. Having watched the sun create the world, Satan's jealousy and hatred intensified. As a means of injuring God and attempting to create his own empire, Satan sought support for his government by gaining the allegiance of God's newly created human beings. He hoped if he could cause that perfect pair to break God's law, he could either force God to reinstate him to heaven or gain control of this new world. Because God values freedom of choice, after warning Adam and Eve of Satan's rebellion and his desire for their ruin, he gave them the opportunity to choose between himself and Satan. God had given Adam and Eve everything they could want and asked them as an evidence of their love and loyalty to him and their faith in what he said, that they would refrain from eating the fruit of a single tree, a tree called the knowledge of good and evil warning them that to do so would mean death. Enticed by the forbidden tree, Eve was lured by the same lies that Satan had used on the angels in heaven, convincing her that God's law restricted her liberty to think. He also told her that the forbidden fruit would not make her die, but instead liberate her to a higher order of reasoning and thus make her equal with God himself. Thus, with one bite, humanity sided with Satan against God, which would have resulted in immediate death had not the Son offered himself to die in the sinner's place. You see, despite God's immense love for man, the punishment for breaking his law is death. And because God could not bear the thought of losing mankind, the Father and Son together decided that the Son would die in the place of man, and thus the Son became the world's Messiah or Redeemer. To represent his future death, an innocent lamb was sacrificed. By believing and trusting in the Son's future sacrifice for sin, Adam and Eve and their descendants could once again be made right with God through faith. The death of the innocent lamb was to be a reminder to each sinner of their guilt and the need for forgiveness from sin only available through the death of the Son of God.
In order to prevent the eternal existence of sin, Adam and Eve had to leave paradise. Cast out of their happy Eden home, a life of toil and hardship would now face each member of the human race. Satan's plans of eternally imprisoning humanity by sin were thus thwarted by the Son of God's future sacrifice. To take away humanity's only hope of salvation, Satan created a false salvation system based on human works. By convincing Cain, the eldest son of Adam, to offer a sacrifice of fruit instead of a lamb, Cain took salvation into his own hands. Then when Abel, Cain's brother, chose to be faithful to God's law by defending God's only method of salvation, Cain killed him, demonstrating that Satan's government is based on force. The restriction of liberty of conscience results in the murder of the innocent by the wicked. To indicate that Cain followed Satan, he received a mark on his forehead. This same pattern would be repeated again at the end of human history. Sadly, the vast majority of Adam's descendants chose Satan's side. As a result, justice was trampled in the dust and God's law was desecrated, leading to a complete loss of respect for life. A universal wickedness so great that to preserve his faithful followers, God had to destroy a wicked generation by a vast flood. With grief in his heart, God finally declared, My spirit shall not always strive with man. I will destroy man whom I have created. But in his mercy, God did not perform his strange act of destruction until he warned everyone of the awful result of sin. Using his prophet Noah to build an ark of refuge from the coming flood, God symbolized the mercy and pardon he offers to all who wish to be saved. Regrettably, the wicked refuse God's mercy, unwilling to follow the convicting spirit of God and the unchanging character of his law. They said it was contrary to the character of God to punish the wicked with judgment and using Satan's first lie, ye shall not surely die. The wicked declared peace and safety when there was no safety to be found. Through Noah's 120 years of preaching, God pled with mankind to turn from their sins and live. Unfortunately, their time of mercy or probation ran out while they were refusing Noah's refuge, resulting in the destruction of the world's inhabitants except for faithful Noah and his family. And this would also be repeated at the end of Earth's history. Shortly after the flood, God instructed Noah's family to disperse and repopulate the earth. Instead of obeying God's law, some of Noah's descendants gathered in the plain of Shinar, the future location of Babylon. Their goal? To develop a tower of spectacular height to render the wonder of the world a universal empire, one world government with one enforced world religion.
In order to protect religious liberty, God confused their language, resulting in the dispersion of the people to form separate nations around the world. Because Satan's followers historically limit the freedom of those who worship God, God has called his people to separate themselves from the world. Abraham, obeying God's command, separated himself from his family, homeland, and all idolatry. Because of Abraham's steadfast desire to follow him, God gave him the promise that he would make Abraham a great nation and that through his descendants the Messiah would be born. As happened before the flood, the majority of people followed Satan and practiced idolatry, vile wickedness, the ultimate example being the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Completely given over to Satan, these cities became so wicked that in order to save his righteous few, God once again had to perform his strange act of destruction. But in his mercy, before destroying these cities, he called Abraham's nephew Lot to come out of Sodom so that he and his family did not suffer the destruction soon to take place. God makes the same call today, and those who listen will find a refuge from the approaching storm. True to God's word, within a few generations, Abraham's descendants became the great nation of Israel. God's plan for Israel was for them to share his loving method of salvation to all the nations of the world. But Israel wandered from God by forgetting his law, fell into idolatry while dwelling among the heathen Egyptians. And this allowed Satan to take away their freedom. They became slaves of the Egyptians. However, God did not forget Israel, and at the exact predicted time of 430 years, he called Moses to lead them out of Egypt and reacquaint them with himself in the desert at Sinai. At Sinai, with his own finger, he gave them the Ten Commandments, his perfect law of liberty from sin and death. In order to help the newly released Hebrew slaves better understand God's law and his plan to liberate humanity from sin, God instructed the people to build a replica temple of the one in heaven. In vivid form, the temple demonstrated to the people God's merciful plan of taking the punishment of death for sin upon himself, symbolized in the death of an innocent lamb. Had God's people always focused on the significance of that temple, they would have never turned back to the slavery of sin. Realizing the power of God's temple, Satan sought to distract the people from this beautiful plan of redemption, and he thus introduced a counterfeit temple system among the pagans. Here the sinner cleansed or atoned for sin himself, even through the use of human sacrifice. As a result, the people viewed God as a tyrant seeking their destruction. And to further obscure God's love for them, Satan's false system of salvation utilized the worship of the objects of creation, such as the sun rather than the Creator Himself, and thus entered sun worship.
Unfortunately, the pages of the Bible and history demonstrate that the majority, even of God's people, have chosen Satan's counterfeit system of sun worship. Nevertheless, there have always been a few that were faithful to God, regardless of the consequences. In order to demonstrate the enslaving nature of sin, each time God's people chose to copy Satan's counterfeit system of worship, God allowed them to go into captivity, hoping they would realize His law and His salvation system are what provide for liberty from sin and death. Babylonian captivity was the ultimate wake-up call. Judah, the southern half of Israel, had almost completely turned to Satan's false system of sun worship. And so God removed his protective hand, allowing Satan to conquer their nation. Yet once again, in his love, God did not abandon his people, but sent them the prophet Daniel to encourage and direct them back to him. Daniel, taken into Babylonian captivity as a young man, displayed courage and faithfulness to God when others would not. And as a result, God blessed him with knowledge and gave him understanding and visions and dreams, leading him to become second in command of the most powerful nation on earth. God gave Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, a dream which Daniel interpreted. The dream contained prophetic symbols representing the future nations and kingdoms of the world. In order to emphasize the sequence and significance of these kingdoms, God gave a more detailed vision to Daniel using symbolic animals. Dissatisfied with heaven's prediction that his kingdom would not last forever, Nebuchadnezzar made the often repeated mistake of creating a mandatory counterfeit system of worship. He decreed that anyone who would not obey him by worshiping his image would be put to death. And he thus used Satan's age-old method of limiting freedom and liberty of conscience in order to control the masses. Daniel's three friends refused to break God's law through idol worship, even though obedience to God threatened their death. Miraculously, at the moment Daniel's three friends were to be executed, the Son of God himself made his appearing and rescued them. This test and its outcome mirror the final events of Earth's great conflict. Because Daniel and his companions demonstrated their friendship to God by refusing to reject his law, God bestowed on Daniel the gift of prophecy, one of his greatest gifts to mankind. God revealed to his friend Daniel truths that would span 2,300 years and would include the exact time that the long-looked-for Messiah would come to earth, begin his ministry, die for mankind, and liberate humanity from sin and death.
Interestingly, Daniel's 70 week prophecy was how the wise men from the east, as well as a few faithful believers in Judah, knew when the Son of God would be born. Messiah, or Jesus Christ, was miraculously born. All human, yet all God, all divine. Nevertheless, he had the same inherited temptations to sin as any other human being. But by faith in his heavenly Father, he kept his Father's law perfectly. Jesus' mission, as foretold by the prophets, was to demonstrate the love of God and disprove Satan's arguments that the law is enslaving and cannot be kept. From the beginning of Jesus' life, Satan sought to destroy him. The war was fierce, the stakes enormous. If Jesus proved Satan's arguments wrong, the universe would know without a shadow of a doubt that God and his law were the source of liberty and Satan was the source of death. God would then be viewed as just in ridding the universe of sin and its originator forever. Even in his childhood, Jesus defeated Satan's arguments and exemplified a life devoted to joyful service. Prophetically speaking through David, Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yet thy law is within my heart. Visiting the temple in Jerusalem at the age of 12, Jesus recognized himself as the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world for the purpose of liberating humanity from sin. Although a child, he did not turn from his mission, but said, I must be about my father's business. At the age of 30, Jesus began his ministry to publicly set at liberty sin's captives and declare God's law of love by living and daily teaching its principles. Tragically, many Jews preferred Satan's false system of human works, as people have throughout history. Those who did so ultimately rejected Jesus who came to save them. Ironically, they chose their temple system, which was the symbol of Jesus, over the true Lamb of God. But death could not hold Jesus captive. Though he was killed, having taken sin's punishment, death upon himself, he defeated it by his own resurrection. And thus Jesus assures all repentant sinners that although the wages of sin is death, he has power over death and through his sacrifice provides the gift of eternal life to anyone who believes in him. Although Jesus conquered Satan at the cross, proving to the universe that God's law was just, the full extent of sin and its lasting effect was not yet fully realized. Thus, God in his mercy allowed Satan to live on. After Jesus returned to heaven, he gave his followers the gift of the Holy Spirit as a source of comfort and strength in the continued war against Satan. The Holy Spirit would remain with Jesus' followers until he would return to take them home. The same 70-week prophecy foretelling Jesus' birth also warned Judah, God's people, that unless they rejected Satan's counterfeit system of salvation, 
God would be forced to modify His plan, where Israel would have been heaven's avenue to teach the truth of salvation to the entire world. But with the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, the Jewish nation's prophetic 70-week time of probation ended. Now Israel became anyone, whether Jew or non-Jew, who followed the Lord, regardless of nationality. The inauguration of God's new group of people, the Christians, was the outpouring of His Holy Spirit, which empowered His followers to spread the truth of God's true salvation around the world. Enraged at God's advances, Satan, using the same principles he used throughout history, sought by force to limit liberty of conscience and prevent the spread of God's true message of mercy to the world. He accomplished this first through the Roman Empire, which decreed laws forbidding Christianity at the threat of death. During this period, untold numbers of Christians were killed. Ironically, instead of deterring the Christians, persecution resulted in the growth and purity of God's church, to the point where in A.D. 193, Tertullian wrote, if the Christians all left Roman provinces, the empire would be nearly empty. Following their master's lead with boldness and humility, men, women, and little children faced the executioner just as the followers of God had throughout the millennia. Their fearless desire to follow Christ was exemplified by Ignatius, overseer of the church at Antioch, stating, Now I begin to be a disciple. I care nothing for anything visible or for invisible things so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ. Using every possible excuse for torture, Satan's followers blamed the Christians for natural disasters and any other misfortune that befell the Roman Empire. The worst persecution of the early Christians came under Diocletian during the years of 303 to 313 A.D. Prompted by a desire to return to the ancient pagan Roman system of worship, Diocletian, under the direction of Satan, sought to eradicate all Christians from Rome. In order to gain national support for his bloody desires, he copied Nero, had his guards set the imperial palace on fire, and then he blamed the Christians. This sparked a most atrocious persecution where every imaginable form of torture was used, resulting in the killing of innumerable numbers of Christians. Describing the persecution of the early church, Eusebius, a 4th century church historian, writes, it was decreed that those who refused to sacrifice to idols should be tormented with countless tortures. Who could count the multitude of martyrs throughout each province? Through the Apostle John, God foretold the ten years of Diocletian's persecution more than 200 years before it began. Imploring the Christian church, symbolized by the church of Smyrna, he wrote, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. By the power of God, Christians withstood Satan, through their innocent blood, many converts were brought to the faith. And 
realizing that his murderous plan to eliminate Christians was failing, Satan, through the pagan Roman Empire, now sought to pollute God's church through error and thereby separate them from God, their source of power. Lulling the Christians into a time of apparent freedom from religious persecution, the Roman Empire now sought to compromise God's true system of worship by convincing the Christians to incorporate pagan traditions. Deceived into thinking this would increase their influence over the pagans, many Christians agreed. The most influential compromise was that of the Christian's day of worship. Since creation, under God's instructions, his people had kept the seventh-day Sabbath, or Saturday as we know it today. Jesus himself kept the Sabbath holy, resting from all his labors, while still providing love and care for those in need. The Bible says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on Sabbath. Interesting to note that after giving his life on Calvary, his first act was to rest in the tomb on the Sabbath day. And following his example, the apostles and early Christian church continued to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. In contrast to God's followers, the followers of Satan had since antiquity observed the day of the sun or Sunday as their day of worship. Although the names of their gods varied, the theme was always allegiance to the sun. Attempting to compromise with the pagans, the majority of Christians now accepted this system of worship by incorporating the sun day as their day of veneration, using the explanation that after all it was the day Jesus rose from the dead. However, the actual change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday did not happen overnight. For some time, the early Christians gathered together to worship on both days, with fasting on Saturday and celebrations and feasting on Sunday. This made Saturday a burden and Sunday observance seemingly more acceptable. But it was not until the nominal conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 321 that Sunday became the official day of worship for the Roman Church. Constantine's nominal conversion to Christianity led numerous pagans to openly profess Christianity and become part of the universal church. Denying God's law of liberty, these pagan Christians clung to their pagan beliefs and their practices, and they incorporated them into the church.
Worse yet, over the course of the next few hundred years, the Bible was abandoned and replaced with man's customs and laws. Despite the apostasy around them, there were a few Christians who continued to be faithful to God no matter the cost. Blending church and state powers, the newly established Universal Church adopted Satan's age-old principle of restricting religious liberty, persecuting all those who dared to follow God's word, and thus began the greatest time of persecution to God's people in recorded history. True to Bible prophecy, this persecution did not begin until Emperor Justinian, in an attempt to unify his fragmented Roman Empire, declared the Bishop of Rome to be the head of the Christian Church in AD 533. But this decree did not take effect until AD 538, when the last of the three Arian tribes who opposed Rome's authority were uprooted exactly following Bible prophecy. This brought on the fulfillment of Paul's prophecy that the man of sin would be revealed. The date 538 served as the starting point of Daniel's 1260-year prophecy, during which the little horn power would rule the world, 
During these 1260 years, Satan would indict himself by revealing that his government restricts liberty of conscience through the most brutal forms of persecution. In order to avoid Rome's bloody massacre, God's true church fled to the mountains and were protected there for some time. However, even the mountains would not always protect God's people from Satan's attacks. Unwilling that anyone should challenge his authority, Satan caused the powerful state church to hunt and destroy any man, woman, or child who dared to follow God according to their conscience. Even in the face of death, these faithful martyrs refused to compromise God's true law of liberty, including the seventh-day Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Seeking to further enslave the minds of the people, Satan caused the official church to forbid the Bible and to kill millions who dared to own or copy even a short passage of Scripture. lack of the Bible led to the vast spiritual darkness referred to as the Dark Ages and plunged the world into ignorance, superstition, and loss of respect for human life. Despite Satan's plans, in the late 1300s, the truth that Jesus was the only means of salvation began to shine as clergy and laity protested the atrocities of the official church. Beginning with John Wycliffe, an Oxford professor and theologian, the ground was set for the Protestant Reformation, which would ultimately reverse the errors brought on by the state church and lead to the era of enlightenment through the mass distribution of the Bible.
In addition to righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ alone, first rediscovered by Martin Luther, the early reformers also identified the reigning church as the Antichrist and the first feast of Revelation 13 who seeks to make war with God's people. Using 12 biblical identifiers, the reformers, like the early Christians before them, correctly applied the 1260 years of persecution to the Antichrist, recognizing that according to Bible prophecy, this power would receive its deadly wound soon, ending the 1260 years of tyranny. Well, the Protestant Reformation was opposed by the Counter-Reformation and the construction of the Jesuit order in 1540 A.D. One of the first jobs of this new secret society was to undo the prevailing Protestant view that the Church of Rome was the Antichrist. In order to accomplish this, in 1590, Francisco Ribera, a Jesuit priest published his futuristic interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. In his expose, he incorrectly claimed that the last week of Daniel's 70-week prophecy was a future event at the end of time, and thus did not apply to Christ, but to the Antichrist, which he identified as a single man who would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Through this clever but mistaken argument, Satan effectively removed the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus as a central theme of prophecy and took attention away from the official church as Antichrist seeking to sit in the place of God. Using Satan's age-old methods, the powerful state church resorted to enforcement, causing all those who protested Rome's authority to either recant or be burned at the stake. Seeking to escape persecution and desiring to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience, many Protestants fled from Europe to the newly discovered and relatively uninhabited land of America and now began the remarkable rise of America, depicted in Bible prophecy as a beast with two lamb-like horns. America was founded on the principles of republicanism and Protestantism, and was established by God to allow the Reformation to continue and God's true character to be rediscovered. America's Constitution was designed to preserve liberty and protect the minority from the mistakes that might be made by the majority. As predicted in the Bible, the deadly wound ending the 1260 years of persecution took place right on schedule. In 1798, Napoleon's general Louis Berthier marched into Rome, took Pope Pius VI prisoner. Interestingly, the same prophecy that predicted the deadly wound also predicted that in the future, the great state church would rise again. It also predicts that ironically, the United States would make a tragic mistake. And in a time of fear, America would be tempted to surrender its constitutional liberties. As a result, Revelation predicts that America speak 
as a dragon. period of great reawakening for the world. Without the tyranny of the state church and persecution, the Bible was rediscovered in its fullest magnitude. During this period, Protestants studying the books of Daniel and Revelation and comparing them to Jesus' own prophecy in Matthew 24, discovered that the second coming of Jesus was nearing. During the 1260 years of persecution, the truth that Jesus would literally return to earth had been lost. Now with fervor, these new Advent believers declare the necessity of being ready for their Lord's return. The news of the soon coming of Jesus was heralded by the discovery of the 2300-year prophecy found in the book of Daniel. This prophecy, which began with the edict to restore Jerusalem in 457 B.C., was noted to end with the cleansing of the temple. And people from all denominations, Advent believers in the early 1830s and 40s, misinterpreted this cleansing of the temple as being the cleansing of the earthly temple at the second coming of Jesus. It was a commonly held error that the temple referred to in Daniel was the earth. Following the simple day for a year principle, eventually the date of October 22, 1844, was believed to be the date that Jesus would return. The rediscovery of a literal second coming was new and exciting news for many Protestants and thousands upon thousands around the world accepted the call, Behold the Bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Unfortunately, the sweet joy of Jesus' second coming was turned to bitter disappointment when, on October 23, the believers found themselves still on earth. Interestingly, their disappointment was also prophesied in Revelation chapter 10 and miraculously led to the discovery of what really happened on October 22, Jesus' ministry as their heavenly priest.
After a prayerful study of the Bible, the Advent believers realized that on October 22, 1844, something of great importance had happened. Just as foretold in the book of Daniel, the great heavenly judgment began when Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place of heaven's sanctuary, there to begin the pre-Advent judgment and to cleanse the sins of all those who had chosen to follow him. These Advent believers found that beginning with Adam and working forward through time, each individual's life record is reviewed in this pre-Advent judgment. Like the symbolic high priest in the Old Testament, Jesus, serving as humanity's mediator, presents to God the Father his blood sacrifices payment to rescue the repentant individual from Satan's government of death. And through this final judgment process, their sins are forever erased and they are granted eternal life. Once again, Jesus, the Son of God, proves to the universe that Satan's arguments are false, that God's law is a law of liberty, that it can be kept as evidenced in the transformed lives of God's followers. The beautiful understanding of Jesus' heavenly ministry as high priest excited the Advent believers to a more full understanding of the gospel and a desire to spread the truth of God's liberty all over the world. With great enthusiasm, the Reformation continued as these believers searched the Bible, more deeply rediscovered the commandments of God, and began to proclaim the imminent soon coming of Jesus. Among these truths was the unending sign of Jesus as Creator, evidenced in the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. They also discovered verses such as Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, which state that the dead are in a deep sleep, a peaceful sleep, waiting for the appearance of Jesus. Following Jesus' example, these Advent believers sought to provide physical, mental, and spiritual healing to humanity, knowing that the body is the temple of God and that we are to bring glory to God through personal health. They taught simple health principles that were 150 years ahead of their time, some of which science is still studying and is only now proving to be true. Probably the greatest discovery was the understanding of the great controversy waged between Christ and Satan over God's law and how this war impacts every life on earth today. With the zeal of the early Christian church, these believers boldly proclaimed the truth of God's character and called God's people around the world to follow Him completely by coming out of the churches which do not fully keep His commandments. At this call, thousands joined the movement of destiny to share God's truth and His love as displayed in His law of liberty. The truth of God's law of liberty impressed upon the Advent believers the importance of liberty of conscience and the right to choose what one believes. They recognize that throughout history Satan has sought to limit this freedom through persecution and that his most successful means was during the 1260 years of religious persecution which ended in 1798. These Bible students knew, according to Bible prophecy, the deadly wound of 1798 would be healed and once again all the world would follow a false religious system. Today we find ourselves visibly living out their prediction. Many liberties are diminishing as we face terrorism and fear, and we're tempted to surrender liberty for the sake of security. Could we not of fear make the same mistake of seeking religion as a security measure and thus be tempted to impose it by force? Could liberty be lost on the appealing argument of religious unity. Is that prophecy being fulfilled? 
A historical turning point occurred in the 1980s when the United States and papal relations were vastly altered in a meeting between President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II. They created a holy alliance which ultimately brought down the atheistic Soviet Union. According to the Bible, even in America, people in a time of crisis will be tempted to unite on a majority-based religion. But if this happens, what will become of the minority who follow Jesus' example in observing creation's seventh-day Sabbath? The Bible predicts that by denouncing the portion of God's law that identifies Jesus as the Creator, Satan hopes to finally receive the worship due only to Jesus and completely gain control of this earth. In order for this kind of persecution to take place, America may be tempted to surrender the rights of its citizens to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of religion. And the result would be a replication or image of the beastly mistakes made in the Middle Ages. Republicanism and Protestantism would cease to exist. According to the Bible, this restriction of liberty will be expedited through economic collapse and the very events that Jesus said would precede his second coming, increasing natural disasters, wars, terrorism, and moral corruption. Amid such chaos, the world in desperation will turn to a central religious authority figure who will then instruct the people that these calamities are the punishments of God and that the world's only solution is to get back to God by accepting a universal majority religion. And this would result in a direct assault on the truth of the ancient biblical Sabbath. Adding momentum to the push for this global religion, various Christian churches within the United States will experience mighty miracles which they will claim are the result of the workings of the Holy Spirit. But according to Revelation 13, verses 14 and 15, these miracles are actually deceptions of Satan and are so convincing that if it were possible, they could deceive even the very elect. If religious proclamations do not follow Scripture, the Bible tells us it is because there is no light in them. Eventually, the Bible says, the entire world, as in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, will be forced to choose to accept either the majority religion or suffer persecution. Interestingly, Revelation says that at the end of time, people will be warned to come out of Babylon's errors. Errors of the ancient King Nebuchadnezzar repeated just before the coming of Jesus. Throughout the millennia of Earth's existence, Satan's mark of authority or false system of worship has been sun worship, which many people have taken to observe as Sunday sacredness. Now, just like Cain, who received a mark in his forehead, indicating his rebellion against the Creator and his means of salvation, those at the end of time who decide to accept Satan's counterfeit day of rest receive a symbolic mark in their forehead or in their hand, indicating their choice. In contrast, those who are faithful to God's law of liberty receive the symbolic mark or seal of God in their foreheads. When that happens, a frightened world resorts to an economic embargo. God's minority are not allowed to buy or sell because they refuse to follow the majority religious view. The Bible refers to this group of people as the 144,000 and describes them as those who follow Jesus and his law of liberty no matter what the cost. Clothed with the sacrifice and perfection of Jesus, this group of people are found to be blameless before heaven. Well, at this point in human history, every person has made their final decision, either for liberty through Jesus or death through sin. The books in heaven that have recorded all the deeds and actions of every person are now closed, and just like closing the door of Noah's Ark, probation ends. 
and our high priest, Michael, Jesus, the archangel, stands up indicating that he has completed his work of salvation for man and probation has finally ended. The wicked, if given eternity, would choose to follow Satan. In contrast, the 144,000 choosing to love God above all selfish desires would, if given eternity, faithfully follow him. To signify their complete commitment and love to God, the sinless 144,000 now stand before God, fully vindicated by Jesus, their great heavenly judge and their great heavenly defense attorney. This disproves Satan's arguments that God's law cannot be kept, and it vindicates God before the entire universe. At this stage in history, these faithful believers no longer need a mediator. Through the grace of Christ and his advocacy for them in the judgment, they now stand before God as fit residents for heaven, forever vindicating him before the entire cosmos. Satan, enraged that his arguments against God's law of liberty have been disproven, now seeks to destroy these people with a worldwide death decree. And at the very hour decreed for their death, their deliverance comes. With amazing manifestations of God's approval, his people are vindicated before the wicked, and events now happen in quick succession. Soon a small black cloud appears in the east, which quickly grows into a bright and glorious cloud of innumerable angels, on which sits the Son of God, clothed in power and great glory, seen by every eye on earth. To the righteous he is their Savior, and with one accord they shout, Lo, here is our God, we have waited for him, he will save us. To the wicked, whose faces turn pale, he is a consuming fire. With indescribable fear, they look on the mighty Son of God, whose law of liberty they hated, and they recognize his voice as the one that pled for them to turn from wickedness and follow his mercy. Sadly now, they prefer death to that voice of love, and plead for the rocks to fall on them and shield them from his ever-piercing eye. In his mercy, God grants their request, and the wicked are slain by the brightness of his coming. Then with a voice like a melodious clear trumpet, King Jesus, who has conquered death, proclaims to the sleeping saints, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, and arise. Clothed with immortal glory, God's faithful followers through the ages come forth from the grave where they've been sleeping, waiting to hear his voice. For those who live before the flood, it has been more than 4,000 years since their death. But for them, time has not seemed to elapse. Their peaceful sleep made the passage of time seem like only a moment, since they knew nothing during that time. With joyful hearts, the angels now gather the risen saints and take them to meet Jesus in the air. And then, then the 144,000 who were alive and witnessed the final events of Earth's history are caught up to meet the risen saints. The holy procession is now complete and makes its victorious journey to heaven where the people of God will spend the next thousand years reuniting with friends and family in a perfect paradise. With grateful hearts they realize they will never again have to fear temptation from Satan or never again fear death as the result of sin. In addition, the saints are given the honor of reviewing the record books of heaven. These books have recorded the deeds, thoughts, and actions of every person that has ever lived. They provide a perpetual testimony that Satan's arguments were false and that faith in Jesus is the only means of liberty, as most clearly evidenced in the lives of the 144,000. In addition to reviewing the lives of God's followers, the saints, together with God, also pronounce judgment on those who chose to follow Satan's government. At the end of the thousand-year period, the heavenly New Jerusalem descends from heaven to earth. In order to allow one final demonstration of the true nature of Satan's conspiracy, God raises to life all of the wicked that have ever lived throughout the history of the world. 
Claiming the resurrection of the wicked as his own act, Satan now performs his final deception. Raising a massive army, he convinces the wicked that by their sheer force of numbers they can take possession of the holy city and dethrone God. Listening to Satan's final lies, the wicked encompass the holy city and astonishingly they attempt to kill God and his redeemed people. This final act of Satan's followers proves that no matter how much time God would have granted them to repent, they would always still have chosen Satan's government of sin and treason. At this point, the great controversy is over, the war is over, God is vindicated. In his mercy and justice, he performs his final deliverance for his people by destroying sin and all those who would cling to it. Just as the world was once cleansed with water at the time of Noah's flood, so the earth is now cleansed with fire. After the earth's purification by fire, Jesus recreates a perfect world in the presence of his beloved children. With wonder and awe, the power of God is manifested as the earth is beautified beyond words. With joyful hearts, the redeemed realize that because Satan has been conquered, sin will never again threaten their liberty. As a result, they will never again shed another tear, never experience any sadness, never experience death. With joy to God, they inhabit the earth made new and live forever in perfect peace because for them, liberty has triumphed over death.